Welcome to Hot Chips 2023. Tutorial 1 ML Inference. I'd like to bring out uh, Micah. He's a principal engineer on the Tensor RT team at NVIDIA. All right, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So today I'm going to talk to you about introduction to inference as I see it. Um, some people will see this as uh, differently, but that's OK. I'm giving the presentation. So as Tom said, my name is Micah Vilma. I'm a principal engineer at NVIDIA, and this is Intro to Inference. There we go. So I'm going to talk about four things today. The first is an introduction to inference. The second is a brief overview of the ecosystem. Um, then I'll be talking about optimizations and finally execution, inference execution. So going to the inference introduction, what exactly is inference? According to Oxford Dictionary, inference is the conclusion you reach based on the basis of evidence and reasoning. In the context of neural networks, what does this actually mean? The conclusion is the output of your neural network. The evidence you have is what was trained, or your prior knowledge, and the input activations, or your current knowledge. And the reasoning is implicit in the neural network itself. It's based on the structure of the network. How is neural network different from training? Well, mostly, neural network inference is, inference is uh, forward pass only. It's no backward pass. So you're allowed to do optimizations that uh, you cannot do in training. The weights are normally read-only. There's also ways you can have um, re update the weights, but normally they're read-only rates. And you don't need to store the activation, so you don't have to do any of the backward passes. The data set is often unknown. It's not just a, in, a training set and a test set. There's, you don't know what you're going to get. You might know your domain, but you don't know the actual inputs themselves. You usually don't have to normalize your data, and you're also optimizing for different metrics. Uh, for training, it's mostly just how fast can you get through the training set and do the back propagation, which is all throughput based. AI inference drives modern applications. Um, computer vision inference is in self driving cars and robots. Conversational AI is a big thing nowadays with ChatGPT. Um, recommender systems, when you go online and they say, hey, buy this thing, that's an AI inference. Or you go to use your credit card and you get. Um, fraudulent transaction, you can't use your credit card, please call the company. A lot of that is done with AI inference. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about what the ecosystem looks like. So you have all these different businesses, use cases, um, companies, industries, embedded, automotive, data center, they are all using inference today. And on, with all these different industries, you have a lot of different types of hardware. You have your vision processing unit, your CPUs, data processing unit, your tensor processing unit, your graphics processing unit, and SOC can take some of these and put them all together. And then we even have wafer scale nowadays. So the hardware ecosystem itself is very diverse and very vast. But what makes AI inference special is the software. So the software ecosystem, this is a simplified model. It's way more complicated than this. You start off with the hardware layer. This is usually done by a hardware company. And on top of that, you build your platform. Uh, this is, you could just have your hardware be into a larger machine, or you could have your OS, but you build your platform on top of your hardware layer. Then you build what I call the system layer. This, for NVIDIA, this is where you have CUDA and NICL, or for OpenMPI for cross-node communication. On top of that, for neural networks, you build your graph compiler layer. Uh, so this would be an XLA or uh, FX, or in my case, TensorRT. And so we optimize the, the neural network down to the system layer, and the system layer goes towards the hardware. Then on top of that, you can build PyTorch, or what I call the framework layer, TensorFlow, JAX. There's dozens and dozens of frameworks. On top of these frameworks, you then build what I call the extended framework layer. This, here you have Hugging Face, which is a popular location. You go get yourself a neural network, download it, and it just works. All this together, you build it into a software stack that then goes to the application layer. The application layer is how you then build the software for your users or for other developers. 
Now this application layer takes all these different models. Um, someone, I believe it was Jensen, uh, termed the Cabrian model explosion about 2016, where originally we had just ComNets and RNNs, but now we have transformers and sparse LSTMs and generative adversarial networks, capsule nets, and more recently large language models with generative AI, reinforcement learning. So you have all these different networks that have to be mapped down to the hardware. And this software is how you do that. So next thing I wanna talk about is optimizations. Now, why do you optimize the neural network? Um, in training, you're going mostly throughput. Just push, push how much data you can through your pipeline as quick as possible. But for inference, you wanna optimize for various things. You wanna reduce the cost of an inference. You wanna reduce the latency in certain cases. <clears throat> Sometimes you wanna reduce the model size. So you train a model and it comes back, oh, it's an 80 gigabyte model. How does that fit on a smaller device? You need to reduce the model size. Or the memory usage. So usually the model size and memory usage go hand in hand, but that's not always the case. Uh, bandwidth, maybe you are paying the cost for uh, compute or executing the neural network on multiple devices and you wanna reduce that cost of transferring data across the network. And obviously power usage given the cost of energy nowadays. So first thing I'm gonna talk about, which is precision. Now, a lot of you are probably very familiar with the IEEE floating point formats. And so I'm not gonna go into those, but AI inference has a couple unique formats. So TensorFlot32 is something NVIDIA came up with a few years ago. It has the exponent of an FP32, but the significant of a FP16. The exponent's important because that determines the range of values you can represent, and the significant determines the precision. So we're able to reduce the precision because neural networks are fairly um, robust to uh, accuracy issues. Um, Google has something called uh, BrainFloat16 or BFloat16, which takes again the FP32 um, exponent, but it still fits it in the 16 bits, so you have seven bits of precision. And more recently, we have floating point eight formats, um, e E4M3 and E5M2. Uh, these are, depending on your use case, these might actually help you execute quicker at a lower precision without having much accuracy loss in your network. Next thing I wanna talk about is a layout. Now, the reason I have this is how do you parallelize your network? How do you parallelize the data? So if you have a scalar format, you can do 32 um, data points with 32 threads, or you can read 32 times. But if you go with vector formats, you can either have one thread read two data points by accessing a single vector element, or you can have two threads work together on processing that data in parallel. Now, this alone isn't very useful, but when you combine the layouts and the precision, you get your memory formats. So the linear FP16 is what NVIDIA introduced with the macro architecture, and for it reduces your precision by half, it reduces your bandwidth by half, and you can speed up your execution by, by 2x. Um, we have an, in uh, the Pascal architecture, we introduced in date. Uh, so that reduces your memory uses by a quarter, and it can increase your performance by 4x. Then we have the vectorized formats, and more recently, um, tensor cores, which are matrix formats. So you're doing like an eight by eight on one side and eight by eight the other side, and together all these threads do an eight by eight ma a matrix multiplication. The next thing to talk about is type and shape inference. So you know your data types, now you have your tensors, and you need to figure out, as an inference optimizer, what is the in output type of a convolution? Now the input type is a linear FP32, uh, maybe it used to be like NCHW format, but the output type can be whatever uh, you think is optimal for your hardware. Now, the determining what the output type of the convolution is determines what the input type of the activation, and what the what the activation then feeds into the softmax, and the output type of the softmax is a uh, VEC2 FP16. So, how do you actually optimize that? It's called type and shape inference in the optimizer. And what you pick, what you select, it determines the performance you might actually see when you run the hardware. Now, in the previous example, we had static input sizes. But in reality, most things are not static. Uh, what I have here is a, an example of how many different video formats there are. There's actually way more than this, but here's a broad spectrum. It's like, how do you have a neural network that optimizes for QVGA format and also handles 1080p HD? 
So what we do in, the, in uh, tensor RT is we call these dynamic dimensions, where you specify not what the dimensions of the input are, just say, this is dynamic, go figure it out at runtime. Now, if you have image sizes, images could be lots of various sizes, so optimizing for the dimensions, optimizing for these dynamic dimensions is very important for handling high-performance neural networks. Then the next hard problem for shapes is data-dependent shapes. So originally we had static shapes, we optimized those, then we figured out how to optimize for dynamic shapes. But how do you optimize for shapes where you don't even know the size until you actually execute the neural network? So how many objects are in each one of these images? In the top left corner we have a whale jumping out of the water, but there's actually like five or six objects there. And the number of objects in the image determines what the rest of the neural network will do. So optimizing the data dependent shapes is very important for these types of networks where you have variable um, dimensions or variable outputs from the middle of the network. So once you've figured out all the shapes you're gonna pick, all the types, then you have what we call quantization. Now quantization, there's be a talk coming after this on that, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but I call it doing almost the same with less. So what you're doing is you're taking your input distribution and figuring out how do I map this floating point input distribution onto a smaller data type, an integer data type normally. So you truncate the outputs and you discretize the, the data, but this does have accuracy loss because multiple floating point values can map to the same integer value. Another way of doing almost the same with less is sparsity. So whereas the activations are normally reduced through quantization, you can reduce your weights through sparsity. There's two types of sparsity. One is called structured and the other is unstructured. Now structured sparsity, there's two cases there. You have NM sparsity, which means for every M values, N of them will be zero. And block sparsity is for given a matrix, in a subset matrix, if it doesn't pass a threshold, then you're gonna zero out the whole thing. Whereas with unstructured sparsity, you just decide, okay, I want 50% of all my values zero. So you find some threshold and you, everything below that threshold is, 50, is, is marked as zero. So you have what methods of quantizing and you have methods of reducing the weights. So here's one of the methods for quantization. You have post-training quantization where you take your neural network and you take a new data set called the calibration data set. The calibration data set is supposed to be representative of your actual real world inputs. You calibrate the data and then you convert your FP32 neural network into an int8 neural network. So you have in the bottom left corner here, I have FP32 convolution input and an int8 output. So this is a post-training phase. There is also another one called quantize aware training or QAT. This is actually fine tuning of your network with uh, data and you try to learn what the quantizable values are. So you insert these fake quantization nodes into your network and then you execute your convolution and you try to learn how you convert from FP32 to int date and then back to FP32. Another optimization you can do is weights optimization. So this is transforming the weight you're given into a smaller data type. So if you transfer FP32 to FP16, you can have some precision loss but normally that's okay. The harder part is converting it to int8 correctly, and that's the quantization aspect. But one of the benefits of doing this is you reduce the amount of memory you take. Another main part of the optimization is layer fusion. So uh, in the graph or uh, compiler world, we draw graphs left to right. But however, neural networks, for some reason, um, did graphs from top to bottom. So what they call vertical fusion is the fusion between nodes that are dependent on each other. So here we have element wise and softmax and that gets vertically fused into a scale softmax. Um, you have horizontal fusion where you're fusing peer nodes together. So you have the three map moles, the Q, K, and V map mole. You can fuse those into a single, uh, single node. The reasons why you wanna do these fusions is you reduce your uh, round trip through memory you can de increase the computational efficiency of your operation, and you can also reduce the overhead from your launch, launching the kernels on your device. 
There's another fusion called time fusion in RNNs. So in RNN time fusion, you're actually fusing across a sequence of inputs. And so this allows you to have more efficient RNNs and you're able to go through and execute Again, more efficient time, you're not pushing your memory, you're not pushing the data out to memory, and you're increasing the efficiency of your overall network. There's another thing called tiling. Now, tiling in some cases is a de-optimization because it actually, depending on how you do it, might make your network slower. But the idea here is when your convolutions or your operations get so large they don't fit in L1 and L2 caches anymore, you start going to L3 or even out to memory and your performance gets bad. So here what you want to do is you, you split your convolution up into tiles and you run multiple operations in a row, but you only run it on that tile. Now one of the downsides here is what's called the halo. So as you have a convolution that's either shrinking or growing, the actual um, receptive field of the inputs changes. So if you have multiple convolutions in a row, you might actually be executing the entire convolution at the first level all four times. So you have to do that trade-off between the, the size of the halo versus how efficient it's going to execute on your hardware. So that's why it can be a deconvolution or de-optimization. The next thing I want to talk about is memory scheduling. So if we look at this top right graph, we have uh, seven tensors, A through G. If we were to optimize this inefficiently, we now have to store all the memory for all of the tensors. However, you can think of the tensor addresses themselves as virtual address, and you're trying to map them to the physical addresses on the device. So you can go ahead and optimize this. It's similar to register allocation, um, but it's an instance of the dynamic storage allocation problem. So instead of having five different tensors taking up memory, you can actually optimize this into two tensor blocks and share. Another thing you do is you can change how you want to represent it. And here we have, instead of putting uh, the D tensor with A, B, C, and E, you can stick it with F and G and you actually can reduce your memory usage again. So reducing memory usage is hugely important in inference and there's well-known algorithms for how to do this. And finally, kernel selection. So kernel selection is how you pick the implementation of everything you've just figured out. But you don't want to pick just the fastest implementation for any single op. You want to find the fastest implementation through your entire network. Sometimes you're going to dynamically generate that kernel. Sometimes you're going to have a handwritten one. But the goal is to find the fastest implementation for the entire network itself. There also is... Um, Earlier I talked about large language models. Large language models don't fit on a single device, so now you have to optimize for multiple devices. So we have, on the left side I have a very simple element-wise network, and that runs on a single device. But if that, those inputs get large enough, I now have to run on multiple devices. So the right side is how you do a distributed network topography. The first thing you do is you take each input, you split it in half, and you send parts of that input to one device, parts of the input to the other. So figuring out how to do this looks simple in this case. But when you're looking, talking about neural networks with 10,000 nodes, how do you actually resolve that across multiple devices, I believe is still an unsolved problem. So I talked very quickly about the optimization, so I'm going to talk now about execution. There's four main execution modes for inference. The first one is offline. Offline is what you have batch processing. You want to, this is very similar to training, and you want to process as much data as quick as possible. These usually have very large batch sizes and you're only caring about throughput. The second one is single stream. Single stream is the inferencing you're going to do on your device. Um, your, your phone, you're asking a question, it comes back very quickly but without going out to the internet. So that's single stream and what's important there is the response time. How, how, what's your latency? So you're going to be optimizing for latency. Um, then we have the server scenario where you're sending your request to a server and it's coming back. As long as you're within that certain latency budget that the server gives you, usually 100 milliseconds or so, you actually can start batching them up and processing as far or processing multiple at a time. So it's a fusion of the two offline and single stream. So you're optimizing the batch size underneath a given latency. There's also multi-stream. Multi-stream, think of that as self-driving cars, you have eight cameras coming at the same time. You want to process all eight of those cameras at the same at the same instance and send the results to your downstream at the same time. A modification of multi-stream is when you don't want all your inputs to come at the same time and you need variable inputs but you need very fast response time. 
So multi-stream takes eight or 10 or 20 inputs, however you need to take up all the capacity of the device you're executing on and have them just get data out of the queue and respond immediately. Now, those were the execution modes. What are some of the optimizations? Uh, people might already know about double buffering. Um, so you, you, while you're executing your network, you go ahead and fill up the next buffer. One of the problems here is this takes twice as much memory. So how do you reduce that memory cost in half? So in the neural network, what we do is we take the head of the neural network and we separate it into two parts. One we call the head and one we call the body. And what we do is once the head, which has all the connections to your inputs, is done executing, we signal back to the application that you can go ahead and fill, this, fill these pointers up again. And so you're actually, you're reducing the amount of memory you required for inference by half. You go back to only using what you need. Now you can go through and try to write software that deals with all these different execution modes and all the, this optimization and many more, but there's already an open source software stack out there, NVIDIA's Triton Architecture. It does real-time batching, it supports GPU and CPU uh, backends, um, it has lots of features. So you could go off and write yourself this code, but I'm a strong believer that you don't repeat other people's work if it's already there. This is already open source, go ahead and use it. So I've talked about the execution, but what about the end-to-end -end workflow? So training is the beginning. That's the first thing you do, you get your trained model. Then you have to optimize the model using some of the te techniques I talked about, about today, and you store this in some kind of model repo. Then you take some, like uh, NVIDIA Triton, and you go off and do your serving, which you're serving these models to clients based on their requests, and you have your application engineers writing some kind of software that provides data to some business owner or business unit or in this industry, and they get the results and then they perform an action. Now, this AI inference workload involves multiple teams, it involves a lot of software, way more than I've um, talked about today, and there's a huge infrastructure. So I hope all this was very helpful and ready for questions. All right, thanks, Micah. So if anybody has questions, uh, please come up to one of the two microphones. Uh, while people are coming up, uh, if we have any Slack questions, we can start there. Certainly. This question comes from Jeff Diamond, who is with Oracle Labs. His question was, do you have any thoughts on using FP8 versus INT8, um, specifically with large language model inference? I personally don't deal with large language model inference. We have a team at NVIDIA that does that. Um, so you would have to talk to the experts in math because it's really how do you handle the precision differences? How do you handle the accuracy? Um, you can train on, there's FP8 models being trained. Um, I don't know of anyone who's training in date models. So in date is mostly a post, tra a, a post training phase. But there's, uh, there's a talk on quantization and edge. Um, I'm sure they'll cover some of these because that's more useful for those than large data centers. This, yeah. Pradeep from Kele, very interesting, Mark, thanks. Uh, question about dynamic shapes. You had mentioned that TensorRT supports dynamic input shapes, but does TensorRT also support generation of dynamic shapes through the network based on certain operators that can generate dynamic shapes? If so, how? So that is the data dependent shape. Yeah. So there's an operation um, called non-zero, which basically you give it an input and say, how many of these inputs are not zero? And that is, you don't know how, what that is at optimization time. And so you have to optimize the model on the assumption that that is going to be over some range. Mm -hmm. And then at runtime, you go through and re trigger, regenerate uh, your memory, recalculate everything once you actually execute. So what we call those is train stations. So you have part of your network, like I talked about the head and the body. Um, the body will get split up into different trains. You'll execute the train, break, go execute the rest. Interesting, I have a follow up, but I'll catch you offline. Thanks. All right, over on the left. <clears throat> 
Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, height challenged. Um, Todd from Twitter. Fritter. Sorry, Fritter. Um, uh, is Wen Mei Hu involved in this in, at all? I know he was involved in CUDA. So you're talking about the professor at UIUC? Yeah. The, yeah, the no, compiler. He's not guy. involved in what I work on. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, do we have any more Slack questions? I do. This one's from Cliff Young from Google. He asks, would you recommend using the same machines for training and inference? And either way, why would you make that recommendation? So when I talked about the, uh, the um, multiple streams, you can use inference on that. The pro one of the problems with inference on a big training device is the inference workload in many cases is single batch. And the training devices are made for multi-batch. They're made for throughput. And so with that multi-process, you can run n different input streams to fill up the device. So you can use the training devices. In that example, is an A30. Um, NVIDIA has the ability to virtualize the devices. Um, you can split them up into, I think it's up to seven different uh, virtual devices. So you can use these devices for inference, but it requires coding them and setting up the software differently. Okay, thank you. Okay. On the right. Hi, good morning. It's Manu from Qualcomm. Um, did I hear you uh, write that CNNs and RNNs and LSTMs, all the different uh, varieties of models, run on the same hardware, but the mapping of the model to the hardware is largely a software problem? Yes. So there was a belief that certain models could not execute on GPUs. And I showed back in 2017 that those models can if you code it up correctly. So autoregressive models, I was one of the first people to show that you could do this at high performance on GPUs. Um, there's, I have yet to see a model that can't fit on GPUs once the software supports it correctly. So is it, is it a matter of um, optimizing versus just running? Like, is that a spectrum? Or do you think that there's one generic architecture and then, you know, even a model that we don't know if today will run efficiently on that? I guess you'd have to talk to the computer theorists on whether these are truly universal devices. I believe they are. Um, uh, from my perspective, it's only does the software support the operations on your hardware? It doesn't even have to be efficiently. It just has to work. And then you figure out how to optimize it. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that wraps up the first Q&A session. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you. So next up, we have Amir Golami from UC Berkeley, who's going to talk about quantization. So he's a research scientist in the RISE lab. Thanks, Tom. Go ahead. Can you all hear me? Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And thanks to uh, the organizers for having me. Let me make sure I know how to use this. Um, OK, perfect. So I wanted to first uh, do a very quick overview of why we need to do quantization by looking at what's happening in hardware. And then um, I'll take a, you know, kind of like a quick, you know, dive into like basic concepts of quantization and then more recent uh, interesting methods that have been proposed, especially for LLM uh, quantization. Um, so if you look at the past 10 years, uh, there's a very interesting trend that's happening in hardware. So this is a slide that I borrowed from Professor Bill Daly. Uh, he gave a talk recently at Berkeley. And um, the x-axis is the year, uh, starting from 2012, where there was Kepler GPUs. And today, we have the H100. And you can see that over the past uh, 10 years, we have a 1,000x increase in the peak theoretical compute that's available with this hardware, which is amazing. And part of that is, is made possible with reduced precision. So going from FP32, where a lot of people were focused here, mostly you know, for scientific computing, and then going down to FP8, and now these days people are even trying FP4. Uh, other possibilities that, other things that made this possible was complex in instructions. Rather than going to simpler instructions, people found that actually it's more efficient to execute complex instructions, uh, such as you know, HMMA, and obviously the process, uh, process innovation. But this plot, uh, you know, if you show this plot in a log axis, there, there's a very interesting phenomena that, that's happening. So let's basically change the previous plot. I also added a bunch more hardware from Intel. And x-axis is again year. y-axis is now normalized scaling of how compute 
peak compute has changed over the years. And so what you see is 98, 1998, for people who remember R10,000 from Tensilica, this is the hardware that Jan LeCun used to train Lenet 5 on MNIST. So what was the theoretical peak for this? Let's normalize that to one. And then if you look at how the peak has changed throughout the years, you know, we had K40, nice landing from Intel, TPUs from Google, and now H100, you see that compute has been increasing by almost like, a, you know, a linear increase in logarithmic scale of 3x every two years. But now if you look at how the bandwidth has been changing over the years, we see that it's much, much slower. So the bandwidth, both in terms of interconnect bandwidth as well as DRAM bandwidth, has been scaling significantly slower with 1.4x every two years. So now across the 20-year horizon, we see that the peak compute has increased by a factor of, you know, order 10,000, whereas DRAM bandwidth has increased by a factor of order 10x. And so now this is providing us with, you know, of course, a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of, you know, compute bound problems are now running much, much faster, but memory is becoming a big problem. So now, if you look at, for example, generative AI, if you look at decoder models or, you know, GPT, one of the main bottlenecks when you're running it at low batch is basically memory bandwidth. It's not compute. In, in a lot of cases, actually, your hardware is underutilized. And quantization is a very effective way of addressing this because when you're doing quantization, uh, you're reducing precision, you're effectively reducing the amount of memory that's required to, to store the model or load the model. So this is an example for LAMA 7B. Uh, so we did an experiment. Uh, this is the model that recently came from Meta uh, called LAMA. So here what we did was a very simple experiment. We computed what's the runtime for generating 128 tokens. So you run the LAMA and you basically time how much time does it take to generate 100, 128 tokens. Tokens are, you can think of it as like smaller pieces than, than words. And so what we did was we basically just changed the precision that we were loading the weights. So everything else is the same, computations are all the same, but what we changed was the precision that we are loading the weights. So we went from 32 bits to 16 bits to 8 and 4. And what we can see is that the runtime is linearly decreasing. So all the computations are still happening in FP16, but just reducing the precision for loading the weights is significantly increasing the, the, uh, the speed. So because this is a memory bound problem, not a compute bound problem. But still there are problems for which the compute is important. Like in computer vision, if you have CNNs, they have a lot of compute for every byte of memory that they're loading. This, this is called arithmetic intensity. The ratio between how much compute I'm doing, how many floating point operations I'm, I'm performing versus how many bytes I'm loading, it's pretty high for convolution on our networks. Or for example, for training even large language models with a large batch, you end up with a lot of compute because you're doing dense matrix matrix multiplications, which have enough computation for every byte of memory that you're loading. So here, quantization is also very helpful because we can utilize reduced precision uh, hardware, such as NVIDIA's tensor cores. So these provide significantly better throughput. And if we can perform the arithmetic in reduced precision, obviously, that's going to be good. Another big factor here for quantization is lower power usage. So this is a, you know, right now it's a pretty old slide, but, but the concept is still the same. This is from Professor Horowitz's uh, paper, a uh, famous paper in 2014, where he computed uh, what's the energy cost of performing different types of operations. It's right now very old, but, but the orders are still the same. Uh, this was on a 45 nanometer technology. But here, the, the interesting thing is the different operations, if you look at, you know, there are 8-bit addition, for example, 32-bit 30, multiplication, he's reporting the energy that's associated with performing these operations. So for example, if you're performing a 32-bit floating point multiplication, the energy consumption is order 1, 3.4, 3.7 picojoules. But if you're performing a 32-bit DRAM read, it's orders of magnitude more expensive in terms of energy. So if you're performing quantization, one great thing about it is that it reduces the amount of memory that we need to load, and that's going to significantly reduce energy. So with that, uh, I'll first go, you know, for people who are familiar, I apologize, this is maybe too introductory, but uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody knows the, you know, common concepts around quantization, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the recent methods that, that are, are being proposed for mostly LLM quantization. So the basic concepts of quantization that you see if you're reading a paper or you're, you know, you're seeing a blog post is, is usually this. The distinction between uniform versus non-uniform quantization, symmetric versus asymmetric quantization, 
and how granular are you doing the quantization? What's the smallest unit that you're doing the quantization? Uh, whether you're doing layer-wise or channel-wise. Dynamic versus static quantization, which is pretty important. It has important ramifications in terms of you know, deployment and latency. And then post-training versus quantization over training. So let's look at the, the diagram of you know, what does quantization inference look like. So on the very left, you have your usual floating point uh, inference where you have the weights in FP16 and activations in FP16. They come, that you perform the multiplication in FP16 or B float if, if you're doing BF16. You typically accumulate in higher precision uh, and then you, you have your activation. So this is you know, the typical uh, you know, pass that you do before quantization. Now, if you're performing quantization with IN4, there's two, two methods that you can, you can do. One is called simulated quantization, and one is integer-only quantization. In simulated quantization, the weights and activations are loaded in reduced bit precision, say IN4. You dequantize these in FP16. So you then continue the arithmetic in FP16, but everything is loaded in, in reduced precision. You do the accumulation you know, in FP16 or FP32, depending on the implementation. And then at the end, once you have the final result, then you quantize it back to in four activation. So you may ask, you know, why, why are we doing this dequantization? Wouldn't this, you know, isn't this against what we want to do? The answer is it depends. For LLMs, for example, for GPT or Llama, the, the bigger models, the, the bottleneck is, is storing and loading the weights. So if you're loading the weights in in four, it significantly reduces the size of the model. And then you can continue the rest of the calculations in uh, floating point. And actually, for Llama model, for example, that we saw earlier, this part is not the bottleneck. So this is completely fine. But for some other problems that are compute bound, you may want to also perform the multiplication and accumulation in integer arithmetic to, to basically utilize reduced precision hardware that have better, uh, better throughput. So here, what happens is that you load the weights and activations in IN4, you perform the multiplications in IN4, but you accumulate at higher bit precision. And the reason for this is that you know, if you keep accumulating in, in four, there's, there's a limited number of numbers that you can represent. So you will immediately hit the, the maximum numbers that you can represent. And then at the end, once you're done with the, all of the accumulation, then at the end you quantize back to in four and you repeat this for the, for the next couple of years. So now let's assume that we're given the weights that you know, after training, we, we're done with training, we're given a, a set of weights. Let's, you know, for simplicity, assume that we have a three by three layer that we are trying to quantize. So these are the values that we're given. Let's say it's, you know, 0.34, 3.75, et cetera. And what we want to do with quantization is basically map these values in floating point representation to integer representation. And so let's assume that we're doing 8-bit eight eight quantization and it's the limited 8-bit quantization. So you can represent numbers from minus 127 to 127. The mapping is very simple for uniform quantization. Basically, all you need to do with this type of quantization is to determine a scale, S, which is very simple of computing. You, know, you can compute the max and mean of the numbers here, and then divide it by the number of bits that you have. So you have, you know, let's say you have eight bits here. You compute the scale, and then you divide every one of the real values here by this scale, and then you perform a rounding. So this int is a rounding. It could be round to nearest, it could be round to nearest even number. And then you have the integer values, this QR is basically quantized values, and then you can perform the multiplication or you know, addition in integer, integer representation, or do fake quantization where you do the multiplication and accumulation in floating point. So this is called uniform symmetric quantization. And so now let's understand what, 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 is, you know, what is uniform quantization. So there's two ways to distribute these beans. So if you have eight bits, you know, we have 256 beans that you know, we can distribute, right? So with uniform quantization, if you look at the weight distribution, so here, assume that, sorry, assume that this is the weight distribution, this is a histogram, where the x-axis is the value of the weight in our layer. Let's say, you know, you have, you know, you're looking at a particular attention head, for example. And the y-axis is the frequency of of how many values, how many weights have a particular value. So this is a bimodal distribution. So some values are centered around minus one, some values are centered around five. With uniform quantization, what you do is you determine a range, 
you compute a mean and max or you know some range and you clip everything around that range so let's say you know we, we take this range and then you uniformly distribute the pins so you basically uniformly represent the numbers that you know any number that's between here and here will be mapped to this value any number that's between here and here will be mapped to this value and so forth but as you can see if you have a non-uniform non-uniform distribution this is quite suboptimal because we want to have higher accuracy where we have more values. So a non-uniform quantization assigns more values closer to where the majority of the weights are. So for example, here we assign more bins around five and we assign more bins around minus one. So the benefit of non-uniform quantization is that it typically reduces the error. You can better represent the values of the matrix that you're trying to quantize, but it's harder to, uh, to implement. It requires typically to store the values in a lookup table. So every one of these values now is completely independent of everything else. So you need to represent every single of these values in a lookup table. So this is 4.1, this is let's say 5.2, this is 5.7. You need to have a lookup table and basically allocate memory for that. The other disadvantage of non-uniform quantization is that now when you're performing the arithmetic, you can no longer use integer arithmetic because there's no linear dependence, right? So either you have to perform fixed point arithmetic or you have to dequantize and perform the multiplications in floating point. It may not be a problem for LLMs if you're doing decoder models for, for, compute, for memory bound problems, this is completely fine. You can perform all the arithmetic in FP16. But for compute bound problems, for example, ResNet, if you're running ResNet, this is a compute bound problem uh, for, for most of the cases, then actually it makes sense to do uniform quantization. So here, you're uniformly distributing the range. Everything you can represent with an integer. You can perform the multiplication and accumulation in integer arithmetic. The second thing is asymmetric versus symmetric quantization. So given a range, let's say we are given a weight, weight layer that has a range of minimum of minus 4.6 and the maximum of the weight values is 5.6. I, I have two choices for the range. I can basically determine this minimum and maximum value just as is, and then say, okay, minus one, 127 is going to map to minus 4.6, and my maximum value, which is 5.6, is going to map to positive 127. This is asymmetric quantization. The advantage of this method is that you're, you're not wasting any, any kind of bins. Uh, you know, you're exactly determining what's the mean, what's the max, and you're distributing the uh, the uh, weight values uh, without any, any waste. But the problem with it is that in this case, the zero value won't map to zero in integer. So the zero value will map to a negative or positive number, right? So now your quantization, the Q, these are the Q values, will be equal to real valued divided by your scale, which is basically max minus min divided by the number of you know, values that you have, minus an integer number. For symmetric quantization, you don't do this. For symmetric quantization, you basically compute the, the maximum of the absolute value of your minimum and maximum. So here, this is 4.6, this is 5.6. We, we symmetrically distribute the values among this range. So you basically say, okay, I know I don't have numbers here around you know, between minus 5.6 to 4.6, but it will make it easier to implement this uh, when I'm writing the code. So you determine this range, you symmetrically quantize this range, and the benefit for this is that the formula is simpler, so you basically just need to divide a real value by a scalar, s, and round it, and the zero value in your real number maps exactly to the zero value in, um, in quantized, uh, quantized range. So typically people, because it's simpler, typically people perform symmetric quantization for weights, because weights are usually very well distributed, but activations are, are typically not. For example, after ReLU, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is, let's say, five. If you perform symmetric quantization and consider minus five to five, you're wasting almost half of your quantization. So typically people perform asymmetric quantization for activations, symmetric quantization for weights. Now, second, uh, second important uh, 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 classification and quantization is the granularity that you determine this minimum and maximum values. So let's assume a very simple, let's consider a very simple network where you have the input here, input x, and you have n layers, 
for every layer, you have different types of, you know, let's say, you know, attention head one, attention head two, and so forth. Or, you know, if this is a convolution, this is conv one, conv two, conv three, etc. for that layer. If you look at the distribution of the weights, each of these has a different distribution. You know, one of them can be more, you know, more centered around a particular point. Another one can have more diverse uh, range. So in layer-wise quantization, you basically determine the range for all of the layers. So you assume that, okay, I look at all of the layers and I determine a minimum and a maximum, and I quantize all of the values in this range. For channel-wise quantization, you determine this range for each filter separately, which is more accurate. And this typically doesn't have much overhead because you only need to store a S value for each of these, which is pretty negligible if you have um, enough computations. But you can also go deeper. So people are now even going deeper. So for every filter, they say, okay, for every filter, let me also even divide this filter by, by pieces, by groups, and determine the range for each of those groups separately. So for example, GPTQ, which is a method for quantizing GPT, uses very small number of values. So group 16 values or 32 values together and determines the range for just those values. Now this was for the weights. What about the activations? For activations, typically we don't know the range because it's input dependent. So every input can result in a different activation range uh, for, for our network. For computer vision, for most of the applications, this may not be a big deal because the ranges are typically you know, you know, around a number. But for NLP, this can, this can you know, for, for LLMs especially, this can range for, from small values to very large values. And the reason for that is that if you have particular input, input sentences, that can result in very large activations for certain layers, and you can have certain other sentences that result in very small activations. So determining this range, there's two methods. One is the static uh, quantization, where you determine the maximum and minimum values of your activation uh, aesthetically. You say, attention head one, input to this, I'm going to quantize from minus four to 5.4 no matter what the input is. Dynamic quantization is, is, is basically a method where you're computing this max and min dynamically. So you look at the values that are coming and you determine this minimum and maximum real time. And computing this max and min is expensive. So depending on your hardware, this, this may, um, may have a large overhead of computing, you know, doing a reduction and computing what's the maximum value and minimum value. But typically it results in better performance because for every activation, we can exactly compute what's the maximum and minimum value of it. Now, the final part is we all assume that, you know, here we assume that we have the weights given to us, but how do you get those weights? One method which is very commonly used is post-training quantization that Michael also mentioned. It's also known as training-free quantization. In this approach, you don't do any kind of further training. So you're given the model and you try to quantize this model as is without any backprop. So typically, uh, without any training, you, you may do backprop, but without doing any training. So typically in this approach, you don't have access to the original training data. So let's say we're given the Llama model from Facebook. We don't have access to the Llama model training data, but you can, for example, have a little bit of calibration data, you know, load a PDF or load some sentences to see what are the different activations in this model. And then based on that, you can adjust the weights, but you don't compute the loss, you don't have the original training data, and you basically um, adjust the weights without doing, uh, without doing any kind of training. This is typically very fast. And um, it, it, it's also very good because you don't, have to, you, know, you don't have to worry about the loss function, setting up those things correctly. But you can also perform quantization over training. So if you have access to the training data, you know exactly what the loss functions were. What you can do is basically add the training data back get your pre-trained model, perform the quantization, but now retrain the model so that the model can see that you're actually doing rounding operation, that you're reducing the bit precision, and the model can adjust the weights so that the, uh, the loss is minimized. This typically results in better accuracy, but it can be very, very expensive. So let's look at how does this quantization average training work. So in the pipeline that we discussed, let's assume that you, know, you have a two by two weight that you're given, you quantize this, so here, the way to read this is that the x-axis is the real value and the y-axis is the quantized value. So if my value is, for example, 1.1, 1.1 will be mapped to this value. If it's 3.6, it will be mapped to this value. 
This is a non-differentiable function, right? It's a stepwise function. You compute the integer value, you perform your forward pass, and then you look at the output of the network. Now you compute the loss, but then to perform the back propagation, you need to use a straight through estimator because this is not differentiable. So you assume that this was, you approximate this with a differentiable function of y equals x, for example, and then you back propagate. The benefit for this approach is that even though there is this approximation, which is obviously not correct, it allows you to change the weights such that the, the parameters are adjusted to reduce the, pre, reduce the accuracy loss. And this is very effective, but can be quite expensive. In some cases, uh, you, you see in the papers, the original model is trained, let's say, for 300,000 iterations. Quantization average training is another you know, 300,000 or even, even more. But it can allow you to go to lower bit precision and still attain, uh, attain your accuracy. So in terms of the difference between these two, post-training quantization is typically very fast, maybe one to three minutes. Quantization average training is typically slower uh, and may require hundreds of epochs or you know, hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands of iterations for LLMs. Uh, typically, no retraining is required, but in quantization average training, you do, you do retrain the model. Post-training quantization is typically accurate with int4 or int3, but if you want to go to lower bit precision, you typically lose a lot of performance. And so if you see papers in binarized neural networks or in two, typically they perform quantization average training. Okay, so just, you know, there was a lot of material here, but I want, I want to make sure that, you know, we all know about these things. So uniform versus non-uniform was how do you distribute the weights? Do you do it, unif how do you distribute these uh, integer numbers? Do you do it uniformly or non-uniformly? Symmetric versus asymmetric was how do you compute this range? Is this a range that's symmetric around zero or asymmetric? Typically for activation, we perform asymmetric quantization. Then we talked about quantization granularity. What, what's the smallest unit that I compute this quantization over? Is it the layer, is it the channel, or is it even a smaller group of parameters? Dynamic versus static quantization. Do I compute this range dynamically in real time? I compute what's the mean and max, or do I assume that I, I'm given these values, I don't perform any real time computation of mean and max? And then finally, we talked about post-training quantization, where you're given the model, you don't do any kind of retraining, as well as quantization average training, where you actually do retraining. But now let's go to the interesting part. So um, it turns out that LLMs actually, it's very difficult to quantize LLMs for, for a couple of interesting uh, observations. The first solution that's been proposed is dense and sparse quantization that I'm very excited to share it with you. So when we were looking at the, these LLMs and LAMA models, we, we found that even int8 quantization is very difficult. There is a very interesting paper called LLM.int8 that, uh, that explores this. It turns out that LLMs um, have a lot of outliers that, that create problems in computing this mean and max. So this is an exemplary distribution where the x-axis, uh, sorry, where the x-axis is the weight value and the y-axis is frequency, so histogram. You see most of the values are, are centered around zero, but there's a couple of outliers which are very, very large. It turns out that if you ignore these outliers, if you ignore these outliers, the performance drop is quite significant and very catastrophic. So these are important to, to, uh, to keep in the network. We still don't know why. Probably there's some instability in training or we are doing the training incorrectly because we shouldn't have these kinds of outliers in the weight values, or at least we don't understand why we have it. But if you ignore these values, then there's a big performance drop. So um, if you compute the range like this, you know, you completely ignore this, say the range is from minus four to four, you quantize this very well, but you cannot consider this. If you consider the range to be very large, then you barely have any resolution you know, around these points. So you lose accuracy again. But, but actually, it's very easy to address this with dense and sparse quantization. The good thing is that most of the values, around 99.99% .99 of at least LAMA models, uh, weight parameters are very well behaved. You know, they're around, uh, you know, they're centered around the number, and only 0.01% are very large numbers. So what we can do is basically with this new method called dense and sparse is we can decompose these weight values into a dense component plus a sparse component. So now basically we decompose these weights, W, into their, you know, well-behaved part, which is the dense, we call it the dense, plus these couple outliers, very small number of outliers, we can represent them separately. So now you have a sparse matrix, mostly zeros, except for these values, and a dense one. And you can quantize this separately. 
because now this has a very limited range of activations of weight values that you need to quantize and this is also very limited range. So basically uh, you have your weight value, dense value, the dense matrix, we know what to do with this. The sparse matrix, there's a lot of really interesting you know, research in HPC of what's the best way to store these. There's compressed sparse row format, there's different formats that you can store these very efficiently. You only store the non-zero values, you don't need to store the zeros. And then the benefit, another benefit of this is that when you're multiplying this with an input x, the great thing is that this is obviously parallelizable. So you can perform the dense part and the sparse part in parallel. And this is especially like, you know, for example, for the new TPU architecture, they have a separate sparse core, which can execute this in parallel with the dense core. Uh, GPUs also support uh, efficient, uh, efficient sparse uh, uh, execution as well. So I'm not going to go into more detail. I would love to discuss this with you if you're interested. Uh, but, uh, but this dense and sparse quantization is becoming interesting because you can treat the outliers almost you know, without uh, any overhead. The other interesting thing you can do is mixed precision quantization. So this is the last, uh, the last thing that I'm going to discuss. Let's say we have a network that, you know, let's assume it's a ResNet network. You have your input uh, from the left and then you have the classification on the right. So what we want to do is reduce the precision as much as possible. You know, if we can, we can, we'd love to go to even, you know, binary bits, but, but we are going to lose accuracy. So one way to address this is to perform mixed precision quantization, where we try to reduce the accuracy for as many layers as possible, but keep the sensitive layers, let's say, you know, a couple of layers at 8-bit precision, the, the sensitive ones. But the problem is, uh, if you think about it, if, if you have two choices for every layer, then the number of choices is two to the number of layers, right? So it's pretty, pretty large search space. It's going to be an exponentially large search space. So there is a method for determining this without doing a brute force, which is um, a very interesting approach. You look at which layers are sensitive, right? How do, you, how do we determine which layers are sensitive? Let me just jump forward here. This is very similar to a Jenga game. You know, let's assume we're given a tower. How do we determine which, you know, which block of this tower we can remove? Well, we basically perturb it a little bit to see if the, the, the tower is basically, you know, uh, is, is going to, you know, get perturbed a lot. And if so, we don't touch that, right? So basically what we do is, in, in neural networks, it's similar. So if we had a way of computing what is the sensitivity of every individual layer or every individual weight, then we can basically keep that at higher precision. So here, let's assume that this, this particular block, if we perturb it, and we see that the loss landscape, if the loss is changing a lot. As soon as I perturb this a little bit, the large, there's a large perturbation in the output of the neural network. Then we don't, we don't quantize that heavily. We just keep that at low precision. But if there is a block that's, you know, that, you know, if I touch it and, you know, I change, perturb it a little bit in different directions and there's not much change in the, you know, uh, there's not much perturbation to the tower, then we can remove that. And in our case, we can reduce the precision for that more significantly. But how do we determine this, you know, What's the, what's the metric to determine this? We can determine this by looking at the loss landscape curvature. So we are, we are basically quantizing a neural network that at the end, you know, we have a loss. If I can compute the landscape of this loss, if I'm perturbing this layer and the loss landscape is very flat, it means that this block is not sensitive. So I can basically reduce the precision for that significantly. But if the loss landscape is very sharp when I'm perturbing this layer, then it means that this is a sensitive parameter and it's best to keep the precision at higher bits. And the way to determine this is using the second derivative, which can be very efficiently um, computed. Uh, you can even compute it with you know, gradients uh, using Fisher information. So if you're interested in that, there's a couple of papers. Uh, there's a method called Hessian Aver Quantization, which, uh, which explores this, uh, this approach. So um, in the grand scheme of things, this compression is just one piece. You know, if you're doing efficient inference, there's a lot of a lot more interesting things. Michael covered uh, some some aspects of this. Uh, some aspects of this. There's a lot of interesting things to do in scheduling. There's a lot more interesting things to do in co-design. So if you're designing a hardware, you can you can do a lot of interesting things by you know changing the number of registers, changing the cache hierarchy, uh, you know, adding a sparse core with, along with a dense core that uh, that can be explored with an end-to-end -end approach. So if you're interested, we've recently um, posted a survey of how you can do end-to-end -end, uh, quantization and end-to-end -end inference optimizations for transformers, which also considers this hardware. If I'm, if I'm a hardware designer, what can I do 
to to, to design a, an efficient um, architecture for uh, for transform workloads. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have you know any questions, please please ask. Or you know if you'd like to reach out, this is my email address. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Amir. So if there are questions in the audience, uh, please come up to the microphones. In the meantime, we can start with uh, Slack questions. This one comes to us from Cliff Young at Google again. He's got lots of questions in this session. I've heard some engineers suggest that quantization and sparsity both reduce the number of bits required to represent the computations of a neural network. So the benefit from one means we don't need to do the other. Do you have any comments on that hypothesis? I can. So Cliff was saying that um, engineers talk about the fact that both quantization and sparsity reduce the number of bits that you need to represent the, the, the neural network. Is the benefit of one, so you apply sparsity, mean that you don't have to pay attention to quantization? Or if you apply quantization, it means sparsity doesn't give you as much of a boost? He wanted to know what your thoughts were on that subject. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a lot of interesting research in sparse or pruning. Um, so far, what we found is that if you're pruning, you know, with structured format, which means you're completely pruning out a particular layer, that results in significant accuracy drop, unless you limit it to, let's say, removing 10% of the parameters or 20% of the parameters. There's unstructured sparsity where you can reduce a lot more of the model, but that typically results in unstructured sparsity, which is difficult to deal with. And um, so far, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're doing this for efficient inference, quantization is the way to go because we can reduce the precision with almost no accuracy drop to int 8. Even with int 4, there's less than one, one drop in performance. But with sparsity, I think the Jerry is still out. We, we still don't know exactly how to do this efficiently. The method that I described, dense and sparse, is not a sparse, you know, it's not a pruning method. It's basically keeping sensitive parts of the network in a sparse format. So that's, that's right. just to clarify that's separate than that. Right, yeah. He was talking about the other piece. Okay, uh, we'll talk to the First on the right. Oh, thank you. This is Manu Galati from Qualcomm. Um, you had that slide where you had uh, no optimization, then fake optimization, and then you know all the way um, you know where you de-optimized de or whatever, dequantized from info to FP16 on the way in, and then quantized back on the way out. I was just curious if you had any data on the effective or the the loss that you you know um, saved by doing that, meaning um, the quality, right? Um, that you, you recovered by doing that uh, de-quantization de and re-quantization versus the other one? Because intuitively, it seems you would incur a lot of loss right in the right up front, um, almost the same as the one on the right, and so why did I bother? So I don't know if you have any data to or any intuition on that. Yeah, that's actually a very, very interesting question. Um, if I may very quickly go back to that, well, I can't do that. So actually, for LLM, it turns out that the main, the main problem is this activation creates big outliers. So if you're performing the arithmetic in FP16, the great thing is that it can capture those very well because it has, you know, it allows us to do very large, large values, or FP8, for example. So there is value in loading the weights in reduced precision and then performing the multiplication in higher bit precision. So there's two papers from Microsoft Zero Quant and a recent paper that came that actually explores this. But this is a big problem for LLMs when you have outliers in, in, the, in the calculations. But for, for computer vision applications, if you're in int 8 precision, it's almost not required to do that. You can benefit from previous precision. But we're also doing one work where uh, we're trying to perform the arithmetic in int 8 while still dealing with those outliers with, you know, with approaches such as rescaling. Smooth one, for example, from Song Hans group is, is one approach. But there is a lot of, you know, a special, a special, a special method that you, or a special tricks that you need to do. Uh, to deal with them when you have outliers. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll take a question from the person on the left. Hi, Jeff Smith, Citadel Securities. I have a question about the uniform distribution approaches. Or sorry, the non-uniform. Can so, you repeat the last part about which distribution? Um, <clears throat> about non-uniform uh, selection of samples for like the, the int four, maybe specifically. So when, when that's being done, is it best practice or assumed that you're basically taking even samplings across like the cumulative distribution function, or is there work in basically trying to find points along the curve where there's inflections? So uh, maybe everything along, you know, 
uh, a given variable isn't equally sensitive, and maybe in lines with like the Jenga Hessian approach, you know, we can probe where things matter and have tighter sampling that doesn't reflect the overall distribution as a whole. Yeah, that's a great point. That's actually what we did in the recent work called Squeeze LLM, that even when we are quantizing this and we are determining the, this non-uniform, what I talked about here actually it's not good to do. Like you have uniform, you have this non-uniform distribution of the weights, but maybe some of them are more sensitive than others. Oh, sorry, uh, I apologize. Um, so when you have this non-uniform distribution, maybe actually the, most of the values centered around zero don't matter at all. Maybe those are actually not sensitive. So a better metric, we have, we have this paper called Squeeze LLM, is to look at the sensitive ones. Let's distribute these non-uniformly around the sensitive values, like co corresponding to that Jenga. Maybe it's just one value that's like, you know, outside of this, you know, Gaussian distribution, but it's very, very important. Let's actually uh, prioritize that more. I think there is a lot of interesting things to do around this non-uniform quantization uh, and, and determining which parts of the network are sensitive. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have time for one question about the actual execution, what is the current best practice on commodity hardware for embodying the lookup tables? So if we have like int8 maybe uh, doing like predicated register moves or is it something that we would like to see hardware add acceleration structures for, for, for cheap localized lookups? Or what's the, the hope there and what's the current kind of best we can do today? Yeah, having the ability to do fast lookups would be great. Like, you know, GPUs are obviously great for this because the shared memory, you know, has, has very high bandwidth. Mem high, high bandwidth. Uh, having this, uh, what we're trying to do is basically reduce the amount of lookups that you're trying to do to reduce this memory. So maybe share these lookup tables, you know, among your network. But having a fast, you know, number of registers is obviously limited. But, you know, if you can, if you can increase this, that's going to significantly re in, in improve the the, uh, the latency, because this is a memory bound problem. Now you're bound by how fast you can load these lookup tables. Yeah, even uh, scratch pads and you know, GPUs are not enough bandwidth at, at that layer. So if there's something like, you know, like a C move equivalent or something else, that, yeah, we, we could still easily imagine choking, I guess, on even like, you know, shared memory if we were leveraging this heavily. But it's very interesting. But thank you very much for all of your thank you. uh, answers. Thanks. All right. I think we can take one more Slack question. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one's pretty fundamental. Andrew Shen, who didn't give me an affiliation, asks, so if the weights and activations are using different quantizations, how does the computation happen? Do they have to be con converted into a compatible format? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so if you have, for example, in four for, you know, for your weights and your activation is in eight, you perform the, uh, all the arithmetic in eight, for example. Or if you know your weights and activations are in like let's say two bit precision and you know eight bit precision, you load them, you dequantize them into a common common precision. Uh, the benefit for still doing let's say four bit weights versus eight bit activation is that you're loading the weights in reduced precision. So if I have like a llama sixty five billion, I load the weights in four bit, but then the dequantization is pretty fast. So then I can dequantize it to eight bit and perform the arithmetic in in eight bit quantization or even floating point. Yeah, great question. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. All right, so that concludes the Q&A, so let's thank the speaker. Thanks so much. All right, next up we have uh, Felix Baum talking about ML inference at the edge. So Felix is a product director at Qualcomm, where he's currently uh, responsible for AI software products. So, take Amy. Hello, everybody. So first of all, we check to see whatever or not um, the, the, the end result is still accurate enough for you to use it in your use case, in your application. The next thing we do is we check for performance. Now that we know that we can compile the model, now that we know that the model is accurate enough, is it still performant to be used for the, for the application that you're trying to use? And then finally, once you're done with all of that, you give that model to your application developer so they can integrate it into the app and you can deploy it. There are a number of tools that I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, that Qualcomm uh, provides to customers that are trying to use our silicon. But for the uh, uh, majority of this lecture and this talk, I'll concentrate on this model compilation phase because I think this is one of the uh, trickiest areas that I would like to cover in the session. So first of all, when we look at the AI specifically, there are certain things that you have to do uh, to set things up. Uh, and this is why the scalar processing is really important in the edge devices. Uh, 
There are functions that you have to do that are vectorizable. There are, uh, there are things that you have to do that uh, involve matrix multiplications, and obviously there are 3D arrays that sometimes your models involved and you have to deal with. Um, I kind of hinted already that you need a scalar uh, threads, scalar processing in your edge devices to do kind of traditional setup application processing stuff. Um, for the fully connected layers, you probably need uh, vectorizable uh, capabilities. For the matrix function, you need a matrix engine. Uh, all of that comes together for when you need to design a hardware that is optimal for executing machine learning workloads. So again, for the scalar, you probably need multiple scalar threads. For the vectors, you need a vector engines. And then, as uh, I pointed out, for the majority of the AI functions, convolutions, you probably need a matrix engine. Lastly, to do anything in an in a edge device, you probably need to have some internal memory for you to store your data, to store your weights, to store your activations, and obviously intermediate data as well. So all of these things come together when you're trying to build an engine optimized for the AI processing on device. Um, the two things that we try to do to make it work efficiently. First of all, parallelism. We want to make sure that we exercise all kinds of concurrencies. We want to make sure that we can actually do things in the most uh, parallel fashion possible. The next thing is we want to minimize the data movement. Um, when it comes to the edge devices, particularly to the AI accelerators, there's nothing you can there's nothing worse you can do than move data around. I mean, I know byte copying is exciting. Everybody does it. But the less of that you can do, the faster um, your processing would be. So and all of these things, again, come together when you're trying to build a device that can execute inferencing at the edge. And this is where a lot of the AI accelerators, if you kind of open the hood and look at what they do and how they operate, uh, they all tend to do things in a very, very similar fashion. Um, let's see. So let me give you a, a couple examples. If you go and look at something like a transformer architecture, uh, well, the transformer architecture doesn't really have that many convolutions. So if you take a transformer algorithm and you kind of tease it apart of what it is you need to do, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, vectorized math in the transformer architecture, but there are not that many convolutions. So if you look at that, uh, about 70 plus minus percent of it would be uh, needing uh, vector engines, and only about 30 percent of that would require um, for you to use uh, uh, a matrix engine. Uh, alternatively, if you look at uh, um, something like a super resolution models, um, you'll find it's actually the other way around. We'll find uh, about 30 plus minus, again, this is just an average, 30% uh, of them are using actually vectorized math, and they are very, very heavy convolutionary. So these are just a couple of architectures that I, that I picked, but uh, any guesses why I picked those? Nobody? Why do you guys think that uh, mobile birds are important and transformers? Well, I think there were a couple, at least a couple questions on a Slack chat that had to do with LLMs. So LLMs are kind of transformer based, which is why I use that example. Any questions why super resolution algorithms are, oh, I forgot. Why the, the, the uh, super resolution algorithms are important. Well, a lot of uh, folks these days have uh, fancy uh, Android or Apple phones with a better and better camera, with a higher, higher resolution. And you also probably have a displays in your devices that also support a pretty uh, large number of pixels. So this is where, again, so where we see the super resolution and uh, transformer algorithms becoming more and more important in the edge devices. And uh, uh, I put this uh, blue, bright blue shirt on purpose so you guys can find me after the talk and ask me questions. And I can, I'll be more than happy to explain to you what we see, what kind of use cases utilize these, uh, these algorithms. Um, all right. So I kind of covered a little bit about how this, uh, how Qualcomm looks at kind of building these AI accelerators and what do we need to do to make sure that the hardware that we build is forward-looking, so when we, not only we can execute the, the AI workloads of today, but we can also execute and be prepared to execute workloads of tomorrow. Uh, but 
executing AI workloads on device is just not enough. Um, as much as I like to talk about uh, ML inference and ML inference at the edge, the truth of the matter is if you actually look at any one of the use cases, if you take a look at any one of the um, applications, what you'll find is that yes, AI is uh, uh, getting prevalent and a lot of them are moving away from kind of traditional computer vision or uh, audio based traditional signal processing algorithms. A lot of them incorporate AI. The truth of the matter is AI is just part of the larger use case. And a lot of times is before or after or during, you have to do a lot of kind of traditional processing. So yes, running ML on device is important, but what you'll find is as you're running ML, sometimes you have to do pre-processing, sometimes you have to do post-processing. And as I pointed uh, before, doing all of those things uh, concurrently doing all of these things in parallel is really important. So again, the engine that we are talking about here is actually built to be able to support all of that and flexible enough to just run kind of traditional computer vision signal processing algorithms at the same time as you are uh, running ML on device. And this is where it becomes important, particularly if you paid attention to the first lecture when uh, a presenter talked a little bit about kind of a batching use case and uh, concurrent use cases and running ML, uh, kind of a single stream, multi-stream and other things. So this is where it becomes extremely, extremely important where you can take your hardware, you can take your devices and you can partition them. And you can partition them and execute things, CV, ML, 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 uh, before, after and otherwise. Um, why is it important? Well, one of the biggest reasons why it's important is, again, I already mentioned and gave it away, data movement. If you can take your uh, image out of coming out of sensor camera, you can load it into these uh, AI uh, accelerator, and you can do everything while sitting in that device. So you don't have to go from CPU to one accelerator to do CV, come back, go to another accelerator to do AI, come back, go to GPU to do something else, come back. All of that byte copying and memory copying is really, really taxing on device, spends a lot of electrons, and, uh, and those don't come for free in, uh, in the edge devices like this one you guys have carrying in your pockets. Okay? So some of the things we have to do to support it is uh, partitioning the memory. So if you do have internal memory, very tightly coupled memory, as I have here, you want to be able to partition it and separate it and say, you know what, this portion is used for my CV type of workload, computer vision type of workload, and this other region of my internal memory is saved for uh, ML workload. And don't try to save it, restore it, replace it, and things like that. Again, uh, minimizing the data movements. So now that we taken device, now we partitioned it, we figured out, okay, I have all these vector engines and I have all these matrix engines and a scalar threads, and I want to be able to go and figure out how to use them efficiently. Okay, so you carved out a portion that you actually want to use for the ML workload. What do you do next? Well, the next thing you have to do is you actually have to take your model and actually uh, compile it to get it to uh, execute in whatever um, in whatever little or a lot of hardware resources that you have allocated for the ML specific algorithm. So first thing that we do is we go through and we do a framework optimization. This is where you come to us with your PyTorch model in terms of flow. How many folks use PyTorch? TensorFlow? What about the rest of you? All right, anyway. Um, we see a shift between TensorFlow, how many customers come from TensorFlow, from PyTorch. There are a number of other um, uh, frameworks that we see customers develop, use to develop their algorithms. But we go take a look at these frameworks, we go take a look at the, the models that customers come to us with, and the first thing we have to do is uh, do some optimizations and operation folding and a few other things uh, specific to that particular framework. Um, the next thing we have to do is we, we take that model that we now kind of optimize a little bit based on the framework that it came from, and we translate it. We translate it into some intermediate representation. Um, there's a philosophical debate that you guys might have. Which one should it be? Is it MLIR? Is it real AIR? Is it whatever it is, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We translate it into some intermediate 
Qualcomm IR uh, representation that we can deal with and work on. What's the next step? Well, I should have had a little animation here to hide it from you. But yes, the next thing we do is quantization. Um, unless the graph that you came to us with is already quantized, unless you guys used uh, quantization of our training and a few other techniques, the very next thing is we have to run it through quantizer. And I'm not going to go into that because the previous uh, talk went through that in excruciating level of details. Again, what's the main reason for that? Well, the main reason for that is because you came to us with a floating point model and we cannot afford to move that many bytes around uh, or bits around. So we try to shrink it down, we try to use all kind of tricks, sparsity, pruning, quantization and everything else to shrink it uh, to as little, the smallest data type as possible while still uh, maintaining the accuracy that your application needs. And this is where things become tricky because uh, if you're building a s app to do selfie, then maybe going from FP32 to FP16 to int16 to int8 is good enough and you might even go to the int4. Um, but if you're building an algorithm to do a face detect on the phone and unlock it and using AI to do the fingerprint or 3D face authentication, well, maybe for that kind of application, this even half a percent or even less losing on accuracy actually renders your application uh, unusable because there are some standards in place that only dictate that if you're doing a fingerprint authentication, you can only do, I don't know, one error in a million. Uh, and that loss of accuracy is not acceptable. So anyhow, uh, we go through Quantizer and this is where uh, that uh, comes in. And then once we have that in place, we go through um, kind of a, a framework agnostic graph optimizations, uh, batch norm folding, stuff like that. Again, if anybody in the audience or online have questions, I'll be more than happy to either take it uh, after the, the talk or tomorrow or send me an email. Um, once we've done all of that, we go into the more interesting uh, portion of the graph compilation. So first thing we do is uh, we do the backend specific optimizations. Now, first of all, if you go through generation of the binary for execution on your device. The, the simplest and most naive way of doing that would be you go and execute one layer on all the input data, and then you go and you execute the next layer on all of the data. The problem with that is as you executed uh, first layer, you generate a lot of intermediate data, and the very next thing you have to do is you throw it away, you lose it, and you go back to that uh, most uh, expensive operation that I talked about, which is moving bytes around, which is probably something you would like to avoid. Um, so what we do is we try to uh, uh, play tricks here, where we try to um, optimize our processing to the most efficient way to prevent the data movement. So which is kind of walking down, uh, not executing layer by layer, but going depth wise and doing a few other tricks. Um, Again, you can read the slides and uh, it explains uh, what it is we're doing there. Uh, so again, first thing we do is we do uh, uh, backend where obfusion, uh, uh, propagations, and uh, common sub-expressions. Now, again, the reason we do it at this stage is because up until that step, we don't really know what you're trying to do or which particular uh, accelerator you're trying to target. In a Snapdragon devices, such as, like for example, in my phone, we have CPUs, we have GPUs, we have uh, AI accelerators, hexagon tensor processor, and a few others. So up until that point, we don't really know where you're trying to run your algorithm. Maybe you're trying to run it on an AI accelerator, but uh, maybe the use case that you're trying to implement is really, really uh, uh, compute intensive and you just run out of processing power on uh, HTTP. So what we would do at this stage is we, you would tell us if you're trying to run it on a GPU, on a CPU, or where else on our device. So that's where the, 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 the backend specific uh, optimizations kick in. Uh, the next thing we do is we do tiling. Again, we break the network into smaller data piece and then we're trying to figure out how to do, how to execute these chunks of data how to execute these checks of information and uh, in the most efficient way to still fit all of the processing inside the VTCM available to us 
and inside of the, the hardware resources that you allocated. Because maybe we have 10, 15, 20 scalar threads or vector threads or matrix engines, but you allocate a portion of that for your uh, uh, computer vision algorithms. So we have to figure out how much uh, we have uh, resources left available for the AI workload and deal with that. Um, next few steps we go through is uh, scheduler and sequencer. And this is where we try to figure out how to um, sequence the execution of these tiles in the most efficient way. So a few things. First of all, I kind of already uh, explained that uh, we don't execute layer at a time. We execute things uh, depth first because uh, if you computed a number of uh, uh, operators and then I have to go drop all the intermediate data away and start again bringing data back and forth, it's very inefficient. So what I want to probably do is continue working down my path, continue working down uh, in the depth of my models while maintaining all the intermediate data within VTCM. Once I run out of the stuff to do and all of the internal resources, so to speak, exhausted, then I have to pause, take a breath, and go do processing on the next tile or go, go back maybe and process things. Again, all of that to do uh, things in a most efficient way, um, minimizing the data movement and exploiting uh, concurrencies. All right, so again, this is where uh, the definition of the order of execution comes in. And um, I kind of already uh, hinted that, that again, all of that is done to minimize the data movements. And then, and then what we also do is the scheduling piece comes after where we try to say, okay, well, we have all of these EDBD little operations that we have to do on all of this data that's already internally allocated and present uh, for us to grab. So how do I uh, schedule all of these operations so I can run all of them concurrently? Uh, I know how many scalar threads I have. I know how many vector threads I have. I know how many uh, uh, matrix engines I have. So how do I get them all running at the same time, operating on all of the available data before I have to pause, before I have to leave? And the last thing that we do is we go and we generate uh, uh, the optimized kind of list of execution uh, for a particular accelerator whatever it's a hexagon tensor processor or other such as GPU, CPUs and, and things like that. So let's just walk through a couple of examples and a couple of things that you have to consider when, when, when doing that. So first of all, I took a very, very simple, um, very, very simple kind of model topology. It has about, what is it? About 10, 10 operators or so. So how many ways we can execute it? This is too bright. Anybody in the audience, take a guess. Wow, you guys are quiet. All right. So obviously, if I have to execute this model with this topology with the 10 operators, um, I can go doing this way and execute all 10 of them. Or ex ex so, so here's just the three examples of the order of execution for this. OK, so these are just three. How many of them are in total? Wow, you guys, anybody took high school math? All right, there are 1,100 topological sorts that you can execute these, these 10 operators uh, in order. Uh, I think factorial or something like that. Um, and again, this is where you go through some of them and you figure out, okay, well, which order does it make more sense based on my trade-offs? Sometimes I want to minimize the, the, the DDR bandwidth. Sometimes I want to minimize for latency. But there are a lot of options that you have to consider. Um, again, making it a little simpler, since you guys couldn't answer the previous question. So you have this uh, model, and it has this A oper layer A, layer B, layer C that you're trying to execute in a certain sequence. Simple enough? All right. So. You run your layer one, then you run your layer B, then you run your layer C. Okay, that seems simple enough. And then you kind of execution cycles I put together just to show you uh, how this is ex being executed. Okay, so far so good. You guys with me? All right. Now, 
the truth of the matter is each layer probably has a couple operators in it. So the, we have a layer A, then B1, B2, then C1, C2, C3, C4. All right, make sense? Again, trying to execute them in the most optimal way, in the most in the fastest way possible on an edge device. So first of all, what's my execution order? Do I do A, then B1, B2, then all of the Cs? Well, that's probably a little bit wasteful. I can probably do better than that, right? So again, I broke it down just to kind of make sure that you guys following, following along. So the first thing that I would do is I would say, you know what? I can execute obviously A's, then B's, but then C1 and C2, I can actually execute concurrently. There's nothing, there's no data dependencies. There's no, there's nothing else that prevents me from running them concurrently, particularly if I truly have multiple resources available to me. As I said, multiple scalar threads, multiple vector threads, multiple convolutional engines, right? So now suddenly instead of taking, I forgot how many, uh, actually let me go back. Instead of taking seven cycles to execute the whole thing, I was able to shrink it down and execute all, everything in five. That's awesome, right? But is it the best way I can do things? Probably not. And again, this is where you go look and say, you know what? But executing C1 doesn't really depend on me finishing with a B2. So this is, uh, again, uh, a simple example, but I can probably shrink things even more and execute A layer, then B1, and then, B f and then if, as long as I have enough hardware resources available, I can, I can actually execute B2 and C1 and C2 all in the same cycle. Um, Again, now suddenly from seven cycles, milliseconds, seconds, whatever it is you want to call them, uh, I went to five, and now I ended up with uh, getting everything finished in four. So summarizing all of that, again, just a simple example, just an easy uh, a workflow, but we go through that process multiple times to generate as tight binary as possible, as fast performant uh, at the lowest memory as possible. Because as I started my lecture, what are the most important things when you're running it on an edge device like this? And I think you guys already said, well, cost was partially the right answer, but performance and the power. So these are just a few examples uh, from, uh, I think I used them from last year, where we um, used, I believe this is, uh, let's see, super resolution face. Some of these are from uh, a mobile uh, ML Commons, ML Perf benchmark. Other benchmark, other models are from others. But this is where we would try to compare and uh, and try to figure out how fast can we run on an edge device as opposed to some of our competitors out there. And again, the longer the line, the, the better it is because this is this particular um, table is inferences a second. And, uh, and based on the, a couple uh, mobile phones, mobile devices that we have in the market, we were pretty easily beating uh, some of our competitors when it comes to uh, edge performance. Uh, but as uh, we talked about before, the, the performance is not everything. This is where the power comes in. And, and again, this is where our customers start looking at uh, performance per watt. So how many inferences you can process in, uh, in a certain um, power envelope? Um, again, I believe we, yes, I listed kind of the same uh, collection of the models to cover the wide spectrum of the use cases that we see. Uh, again, super resolution is something we see a lot. Face recognition is uh, something that we see our customers use on device a lot. And then natural language processor. Again, this is just for me to throw in a transformer type of network because this is what kind of a lot of LLMs these days and Gen AI uh, models are utilizing. And again, uh, we were uh, pretty happy that following all these steps that I uh, identified to you to uh, generate this really fast, uh, really uh, tight uh, binary, we were able to easily bid. So again, why is it important? Because a lot of the times what we have is we have these use cases that uh, sustained, 
Uh, for example, you are uh, during my talk. For example, uh, we might have running uh, for the last thirty minutes or so. We could have run uh, a translation use case or translation application, and it's not that it has one frame, one picture, like a selfie, and you have to process it and be done. When you're running tr translation kind of applications, you have to do it for a very long time. And not only you have to run it for a very long time, you also have to do a lot of other things at the same time. So this is where you go and say, you know what, in my device I might have, I don't know, five watts, but two of them are allocated for this specific action and three of them allocated, well, if we have five, uh, two of them allocated for this activities, two allocated for this activities, so I only have one watt left. So let me see what can I do within that one watt uh, power envelope. And this is where having a very, very efficient uh, processing at the edge becomes really important for real-time, uh, real-life use cases. So with that, I think this was my last slide. And uh, I know that there were a number of questions in the previous section uh, sections. So what I did is I tried to talk faster uh, than I normally would. So I have an extra uh, four or five minutes left for Q&A session. So with that, any questions in the audience? And I try to stay here, stand here and not walk around and wander. <laughs> so you guys can hear me. Oh, it's fixed? All right, awesome, thank you. All right, thanks Felix. So if anyone here has questions. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone in the room has questions, please line up at the mics. Uh, we'll start take, with taking questions from Slack. Oh, certainly. Early in your talk, you were talking about the trade-off between things that could be processed as, as vectors and matrices. And the question was, do you have a breakdown of the percentages? Is that based on the total ops or the total runtime when you're making those math operations? I don't know what you mean by total runtime, but it's definitely a number of total ops. So again, and total ops are not layers, right? We take a layer, we break it down into these operations. And what I did is I think I just tried to generalize and said, you know what, out of these operators that we need to execute to do a super resolution kind of algorithm, eh, about 90% uh, of them are convolutions. So there are matrix based multiplications and about, I forgot what was the number, 30 are kind of vectorizable instructions. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ron, Ron from Amazon. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, you mentioned that during compilation you also take care of quantization. Does the compiler decide on the target data type or is that specified by the user or application? That's an awesome question. Uh, definitely user. Definitely user because we don't know what accuracy is good enough for you. So what traditionally what we've done, what our workflow identify it says traditionally you come to us with a floating point models and you tell us what quantization level you are targeting and then we go and as part of our quantization exercise we go down to in 16 in 8 in 4 whatever you defined um, and then we compile based on that data type now based on the one of the first slides that I showed is we compile your model then we let you run it and try it and then we come back with an accuracy uh, to you and then it's up to you to decide is this accuracy good enough if you went all the way to in four Is it good enough for your application now? What we also have is The workflow that I define is just to compile things once you tell us what to compile it down to we here at Qualcomm have additional tools that can actually help you with that exercise where we go and say you know what um, You tell us what the accuracy criteria what an accuracy drop you might tolerate. And then we have tools that would go and actually try to take it there. For example, we, and the way it works is we have this capability called uh, automatic mixed precision, where we take your model and we go down all the way to int 8 or int 4, whatever you, you tell us to go to. And let's say we come back and say, you know what, here's the accuracy that uh, we get with it. And the drop, the accuracy drop is this big or this small, right? And then what we do is, if you, again, there's a tool available for that, is we would actually walk your model almost backwards a couple times, where we go and say, you know what, but if I leave the accuracy of this layer, what it is, and I change, bring up the, 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 the data type for the next layer, will it improve the overall accuracy, yes or no? And then we walk it backwards, 
And then at the end of the day, what we end up with, we end up with a model for you that says, you know what, these layers are in 4 or 8, this one's in, in 16, um, to come up with this mixed precision type of model that at the end of the day still fits your accuracy guidelines that you gave us. Thank you. Okay. This is Pradeep from KLA. Very interesting analysis of uh, workload split up between AI and image processing, right? Which I think is normally brushed under the carpet. I do have a question related to that. So in your hardware, you'd mentioned that you have vector accelerator engines and matrix accelerator engines that are used by different components of the same graph. Now, when you do that, uh, how do you avoid data movement between these accelerators? Do you have a large global memory equivalent that's shared or do you take care of data marshalling? Can you talk a little bit about how the hardware is designed to handle this? Sure, absolutely. I think that it is not a big secret that you have a CPUs, you have your storage memory and things like that. Then you have your uh, DDRs and other things and caches. And then lastly, within an accelerator itself, you have a, as I think my slide was talking about, TCM or VTCM, very tightly coupled memory. So that VTCM is kind of the last memory before the, the computational engine, so to speak. And that's what I was talking to you that we're trying to optimize for. Making sure that we can do as much processing as we can while sitting there. Because both uh, vectors and scalar threads and, uh, and uh, matrix engines can, act, can, can get access to that. Okay. So when I talked about optimizations, I talked about optimizations specific to that particular memory. Obviously, once you run out of that memory, you can go to the DDR, you can fetch more things and do other things but that becomes a little bit more expensive. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's take one from the speaker on the left. Hey, this is Sumit from Google. So do you think we are going in a direction where the hexagon coprocessor or this accelerator core is gonna merge into the central application processor complex or do you think these are gonna be like two separate pieces for some time? That's an awesome question. I think if you look at CPUs evolutions. What you see is you have the CPUs in the past, and then most of us in these mobile devices probably use ARM, some kind of ARM architectures. And then what ARM has done is they said, you know what, there's so much math people doing on the main CPUs, so probably we need to use to add uh, um, Neon to it, right? And what is it for? Well, that's exactly there to, to help you with the vectorizable math. So I think the trend already set that way. So I think that indeed we will see over time uh, the CPUs start adding not just, uh, I guess, the transition from Neon to SME and then the SVE and a few other things. Uh, so, so I do see that trend continue with folks trying to add uh, matrix and uh, in addition to vector capabilities to the CPU. But again, CPUs are general purpose processors. So while I do see that they're probably going to add some additional hardware probably over the next few years to do better at uh, AI-specific operations, I feel that this would be very this would be very tactical, so to speak. And and yes, they'll do a little bit better than what CPUs do today, but nowhere close to the compute capabilities available in these uh, AI ML uh, uh, accelerators. Okay. And one of the, I mean, even today, one of the things that I always working with customers on, you take an app, uh, I don't know, my favorite app is taking pictures, right? Everybody taking pictures with their cell phones, I hope. Okay, so you take pictures with your cell phone. Um, on average, based on the customers I work with, if you're taking a selfie or your camera app has 10, 20 different uh, ML-based algorithms, depending on what you're doing. Are you taking video? Are you taking selfie? Are you taking portrait mode? Um, noise balancing, super resolutions, um, uh, face detect, and a few others, right? And this is where it is very easy to overload even the most potent AI accelerator. So you'll have to go look at all these algorithms and figure out, okay, well, how many can I still fit and execute on my AI accelerator? And what do I do with the rest? Well, the rest you can probably route to the GPU and then run them concurrently. The rest you can probably route to the CPU. And one of the exercises we do all the time is we'll look at the compute necessary for all of them. And even before trying to over push them all to the accelerator, we go and say, you know what? This particular workload is very tiny. Um, 
It doesn't take a lot of uh, compute resources, and uh, it does not tolerate latency. So however close my AI accelerator to the CPU is, it's still latency to move the data back and forth, to, to load the model there, to load the, the images there. So, so we go through and we kind of look through the list and it's like, okay, these ones, just keep them on the CPU. The rest of them can go to these dedicated NPUs, so to speak. And, and if you add additional AI processing to the CPU, then you kind of have to walk down through your analysis again and say, okay, well now my CPU can do a little bit more, so how many of them can I still keep on a CPU without having to go to the NPU? Again, from power, from performance, everything running on NPU makes sense, but uh, as a system developer, as an application developer, this is what you have to go through and, and determine how to run things. Because if there's one thing I learn is every year as we go through three-year-old phones, two-year-old phones, this year-old phones, this year of phones, or the ones that are launched, uh, people try to, our customers, uh, add more and more uh, algorithms, add more and more enhancements to their application and algorithms. And trust me, uh, as when I take my selfies, I need every single one of those algorithms to make me look good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the Slack channel before we go back to the live questions. Okay, we actually have quite a pile coming in the Slack channel. This one seems kind of interesting, though, to a few people. Uh, Vinay Gudardi uh, from Intel is asking, what's the role of edge devices for LLMs? The ah. memory capacity is limited to house the 10 billion plus models on them. Are they just used as front end in inference, uh, uh, interface, excuse me, and back end processing is offloaded to the cloud or data structure? I love that question. I love that question because it actually highlights one of the things that we run into face first. Because traditionally, when you go with these AI algorithms that are uh, targeted for the edge devices, we tend to shrink them, we tend to prune them, we try to make them as small as possible to run them. And up till now, up till this year, we were kind of good at it, and there were a couple approaches people would take. They would either build one big NPU, so to speak, to handle, to have a Ferrari-sized engine to handle a lot of compute for these things. Alternatively, we have a, a number of hardware vendors that would actually go and build these um, 10, 20 different identical accelerators and put them in their NPUs to handle these small concurrent use cases and things like that. And then we arrived at LLMs and LLVMs, right? And these are just monstrous network. So there are a lot of challenges we have to deal with to be able to run them on edge. Uh, dealing with memory, dealing with sizes, dealing with footprint dealing with all kinds of other aspects of that that would allow us to actually take them and run them on device. Uh, the one thing that I would love to, for you guys to, to go look at is uh, at Qualcomm, we've done a lot of work with that. I think we have a few demos on how to run stable diffusions and control nets and a few other things on actually existing devices. So if you have a, a last year phones, uh, you can use those uh, examples that you can download and actually get them to run on our last year uh, phones. And uh, maybe next year I'll come back and I'll tell you about uh, running Llamas and, and other uh, seven or more uh, billion parameter devices on the phones as well. But uh, unfortunately right now it's too early for me to talk about that without getting into trouble with my legal, de legal department. Thank you. <laughs> right, let's take the next question from the right side. Uh, thanks for your great talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, layer fusion optimization because uh -huh. uh, I, I want to know how to handle the weight loading because you need to divide the uh, uh, layer into blocks and blocks. So uh, after finish one block, so how to handle the next block the weight? Because uh, if you want, uh, if the on chip memory is full, uh, you need to reload the weight for the next block. Yeah. So I'd rather talk to you specifically after the talk because it's going to take a... I mean, I can definitely get a napkin and draw it out for you and explain, but the, uh, we are handling it inside our compilation algorithm. We have a number of different uh, uh, techniques that we use where we're going through the opfusions to figure out what's the most optimal way to do it based on the operators before, the operators are after, and this is where the whole sequencing uh, and tiling uh, algorithm becomes very, very uh, important. Uh, we have a number of different, actually, sequencers that we utilize once we get your model and we go look through that. That's when we try to apply all these different patterns 
uh, to try to do it in a most efficient way. All right, and then for our last question, we'll take it from the microphone on the left. Yes. Hi, I'm Tom Hamburg, I do physical design. And uh, my question is kind of the opposite of what the previous speaker at this microphone <laughs> asked, which is my question is, is it good to move it not just to the edge processing, but the edge of the edge, and instead of integrating in the neural network stacks into the application processor to maybe even integrate them in right into the, for example, the, the sensor system, like the image sensor, uh, are your, is your system, your libraries, your methodology at Qualcomm, uh, can it be customized to integrate perhaps a lightweight neural network system into, uh, into uh, a processing layer for an image sensor? So that way it's all taking place right for really low latency applications. So I think we see a lot of that um, happening in a different subsystems. For example, what we've done is we have, uh, uh, as we call it, hexagon tensor processor, which is kind of a general purpose AI NPU based uh, accelerator. Uh, we also have a uh, low power AI island that is specifically dedicated for dealing with what you described, with a sensor inputs, with uh, always on camera, with, uh, with an audio uh, workloads. And we actually have a dedicated uh, AI accelerator, dedicated uh, a tiny NPU as part of that block to specifically help with, uh, with those workloads as they transition from kind of trans traditional audio algorithm to use uh, AI more and more. Uh, so we've seen that uh, already. The challenge with that is a lot of the times if you take your AI accelerator and you make it part of your image sensor, for example, or, or other technologies, they become very, very dedicated. They become very, very custom. And, and yes, we've done that analysis. For example, we can go and look and say, you know what, if you have an audio DSP for the sake of argument, how many different audio networks? So it probably needs to work with a noise cancellation and a few other things. And then we can identify which layers those have and then make a custom NPU to just handle those things. And it's great and it works except six months from now, three months from now. Next weekend, maybe there's another conference and another paper published with some new and improved uh, algorithm. And what will happen is that this custom NPU that you just designed for your image sensor or for your audio DSP or for whatever the sensor you're talking about, it suddenly cannot deal with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I talked about our hexagon tensor processor, because it's flexible enough to run two-year-old models, two-year-old algorithms, and year-old algorithms, and what we see tomorrow, which is LLM, LLVMs, and other Gen AI type of workloads, because it's flexible enough. Um, so sometimes it does make sense, and others it just it doesn't. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. All right, so that brings us to the end of our first session. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you.